So far, we have visited the classical linear elasticity theory in which we considered that temperature, temperature is kept constant <coughs> all along the process. This is sometimes a simplification because sometimes, in fact, temperature never, never remains constant, but some cases, in some cases the variation of the temperature becomes negligible, but in other cases it's not. So uh, now we are entering into what is the modifications, what are the modifications that we have to introduce into the linear thermal elasticity, into the linear elasticity theory to account for thermal variation. That is what is called linear thermal elasticity. And the simplifying hypotheses are in principle the same. So we assume the infinitesimal strain framework, the existence of the reference states where the strains and the stresses are zero. We assume that the material is isentropic, so entropy is kept, is kept constant, and adiabatic, which means, means that the total the total amount of heat entering into the body is kept constant. But this doesn't mean that the problem is, is isothermal. So we, cons we consider that the temperatures now can vary. That's the main difference with respect to the previous case of linear elasticity. So if we talk about theta as the absolute temperature, theta is the absolute temperature, that means that theta is greater than zero. And the hypothesis that this temperature was equal to the original one, and the rate of this temperature is, is zero, is not longer valid, and we assume that the rate of temperature can be now different from zero, so there are increments of temperature with respect to the reference configuration. Uh, well, we have already visited that. It's entropic and adiabatic means this, that the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the entropy is kept constant and, again, in local form, that the local counterpart of the heat entering into the particle uh, due to the sources and due to the conduction is uh, equal to zero. So how do we modify the Hooke's law or the generalized Hooke's law in case of considering variations of temperature is that. Look, this part, this part here, the first term, stands for the stresses that are produced in the isothermal case. So when there is no change of temperature. And then we introduce an additional term which accounts for the increment of temperature with respect to the reference configuration. That's what we call delta theta. In that sense, delta theta uh, is, is, is something that can be referred now to the standard temperature measure, Celsius degrees, etc., because the reference configuration is just shifted 273 degrees, so the, the increments are not affected by the shifting. So finally, the Hooke's law is that. Look, that's very important to, to remember. We have that the stresses in case of change of temperature are the ones that it would have if we had no change of temperature, minus, 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 don't, don't forget this minus here, minus a correction which is proportional to the increment of temperature. So, of course, if the problem is isothermal or approximately isothermal, this increment of temperature is zero and then we recover the isothermal case. Look that a new coefficient appear here. Well, in the more generalized case, this is not a, co a coefficient, this is a tensor. It's a symmetric tensor, because the stresses are symmetric, that should be symmetric too. It's a symmetric tensor, which has then in consequence, how many properties? How many different properties? Six. So on top of the 36 that we had counted for this part here, in order to represent the elastic behavior for the isothermal case, uh, accounting by the major and minor symmetries, here we have six more. Now it's 42. 
36 mechanical properties and six, uh, property, six thermal properties that again have to be defined uh, by means of experiments for every material. Okay. So this is called the tensor of thermal properties or thermal of constitutive <coughs> thermal properties. Mm -hmm. It's a symmetric definite positive, positive definite second order tensor. However, this is not the case that we are interested in because we want to simplify it as much as possible. So in general, we'll go to isotropic case. In the isotropic case, as I said, the iso is material isotropy means that the, the material properties are the same in all directions. And this is translated in the fact that all tensors appearing, defining the material properties should be isotropic. Since this is a fourth order tensor, that has to be a fourth order isotropic tensor, isotropic mathematically isotropic. That means that the components, the components, all the components of the tensor do not change when we change the system of the, the system of reference. Not one, not the diagonal, not the invariance, no, no, all the components. So that means that this is a fourth, it has to be, if, if, if you want to represent a material which is isotropic, this tensor has to be isotropic, and this tensor has to be also isotropic, because both represent the material properties of the, or the, the property of the material. So now let's look to the material isotropy from the mathematical point of view. This has to be a tensor that whose components doesn't vary. So that means that this tensor has to be isotropic and also this tensor has to be isotropic from the mathematical point of view. That means it belongs to that family of tensor tensors whose components do not change as we change the directions of the of the of the system of coordinates the general family that makes a fourth order tensor isotropic has this term where lambda mu are any coefficients okay where one is the unit tensor second order tensor and i is the fourth order unit tensor so this is something that we already saw for the elastic material now for the thermoelastic we have also to improve to impose that this tensor is also isotropic. And I just want to recall something that I also uh, asked you at some time. What is the general expression of the isotropic second order tensor? So that tensor whose components do not change as we change the system of coordinates. So in that sense, we have to impose now this beta being an isotropic second order tensor, which as I told you, the most general expression of a second order tensor, which is isotropic, that is, their, its components do not change when we change the coordinates, it's just the unit tensor, which is isotropic, the component of the unit tensor do not change when we change the coordinates, one, one, one in the diagonal, in our system of coordinates, multiplied by a, a, a constant. So this has to be the structure of this uh, uh, tensor of thermal properties that we introduce in the thermoelastic case. So, now the number of properties involved are two for the non-thermal part and just one, one for the thermal part. This will call, from now on, will be called the thermal constant parameter or the thermal uh, property, okay? So, now let's see, for this case, how is the, the constitutive equation uh, comes out when we replace C and beta by uh, isotropic tensors. So we replace C in that way, beta in that way, we replace in that equation, and after some operations, we obtain the following. Look, this is the resulting function. We have that this first part provides some stresses that follow exactly the same formula that we had for the isothermal case. So lambda trace of the strains times one plus two mu times the strains. And this is in uh, notation, uh, initial notation. And now the second part looks like that. 
Beta, beta now is a scalar, just one scalar, which is multiplies the increment of theta, the temperature, times the unity tensor, which is this. So we have to correct the inelastic strains by this correction in terms of the thermal property. Okay? Now the stresses not only depend on the, on, on the strains, they all, all see only depend on temperature. But we can identify two separate parts. That part of the stresses that only depend on the strains, and that part that only depends in the temperature, in the on the increment of temperature. 